Do we only have six years left? I can tell you when you look at the world scene, you can see organizations like the World Economic Forum preparing for dramatic change in the world in the next six years. Will the church be ready for it? Tonight we have a prophetic voice with us who says that we only have six years left and that we are the World War III generation. How are we to prepare for what's coming? How can we stand strong to thrive and not just survive in the last days? You're going to be blown away by the revelation that's presented. But before we dive into that, he's written an amazing free ebook the seven prophetic things to prepare for in 24. We're going to talk about that and much, much more, but we want to hear from you. What are you preparing for in 24? Let us know in the comments. And without further ado, here's our guest, Apostle Tommy Ariami. Apostle Tommy, thank you so much for joining us on Encounter Today. Thank you for having me, Alan. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's, it's been such a joy for me, as I was mentioning to you earlier, to dig into the mission, the vision, the message that God has given you recently, and to dive into your materials. And again, we're going to provide the links for all of the Prophet's materials here below, so I want all of our audience to take advantage of that. But let's dive into this. You're going to be offering everyone who's watching this a free brochure or ebook, if you will, of the seven prophetic things to prepare for in 2024. Now, we're going to get into... The prophecy you gave of we only have six years left here in a moment, but let's talk about 2024. What has the Lord shown you for this year, and what do we need to prepare for? Sure. So uh, the Lord really spoke to me about several things concerning 2024, and I put them all into a, a I guess, a yearly prophetic video that I put out um, just to help people prepare, not just prophetically, but strategically as well, because mm. I don't believe in the prophecy that's just there's no hope there's doom everything's bad i believe that there's always a redemptive purpose in everything god says to us prophetically so i'm always looking out more for strategy than i am for prophecy or just as much actually wow it's a cause the tribe that knows times and seasons but they also know what to do and so you know i'm, I'm i grow weary of prophetic that just tells us what's coming but doesn't yes. actually position us with strategy so we can take tangible steps to partner with the lord for what's coming ahead and so one of the things the lord began to speak to me about 2024 was it was going to be a season of the days of noah and we were mm. really heading into that time where you know the bible says that the end times will be like the days of noah and in the days of Noah, um, what you had was, the Bible says, violence was there and corruption was there. And so with, it, it seems like corruption and violence are binary paired. So the more corruption you have, the more violence increases. And so that word violence is a really interesting word in the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word Hamas. And mm -hmm. so it's not just a tribal term. Hamas means violence in, in the Hebrew. But it's interesting how corruption brings about that Hamas. And so I said to the Lord, what are you looking for in the midst of a rise in corruption or a rise in violence? He said, I'm looking for the preachers of righteousness. I'm looking for the uncompromising, incorruptible, can't be bought kind of movements in the earth that their voices are not for sale to hmm. AstraZeneca, Democrat, Republican, uh, that their voices are only owned by the Lord. And, you know, our ministry is called Greg, which stands for Restoring Issachar's Generation. And when you look at Issachar, their name, even though they're a prophetic tribe, their name doesn't mean prophetic. Their name actually means to hire for money. That's what Issachar actually means. And so you look at that term and you go, why would God put P-R-O-F-I-T next to P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Why would wow. he align money with the prophetic tribe? God has no issue with prophets being honored financially. He has no issue with that. We see that throughout scripture. But the, the question of this prophetic movement is who is hiring the mouths of the prophets? When Abraham returned from the defeat of the kings and defeated Sodom and the king of Sodom came to him and said, I'll give you money. Just give me the people. Sodom, Abraham said, no, lest it be said that you made Abraham rich. And so he walked away from money. 
And in the mm. very next chapter, God said, Fear not, O Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great Issachar. You, I'm going to pay your bills. I'm going to pay for your mouth. I'm going to salary you to say the things that I need to be said and not the things that are politically appeasing. The reason we have corrupt politicians is because we have corrupted the prophetic movement. God's eyes are not on the elections. They're on the elect. And I wish I could uh, scream this to America. Come on. He's looking at the elect. He's looking at the church. He's looking at us and saying, who's buying your mouth? I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. You know, God, God tells, God tells Pharaoh, uh, to, I mean, tells Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And the first thing God had to do before he sent Moses with a prophetic message was he had to deliver the deliverer from the economic dependency to Pharaoh. Because you can't tell Pharaoh, let my people go and be on his payroll at the same time. You have to decide who's going to feed you. And for, for us, the prophets or the prophetic people, which I believe were all prophetic people, according to Acts 2 and the scripture says, my sheep hear my voice in John 10, 27. I believe that the desire of God is actually to shift us out of places where our mouths may be held ransom by our salary, our nine to five job, you know, because some people are nurses, but they're called to speak. But it's like, well, if I speak, I'm going to lose my job. And so that's a kind of being bought. So we're not mm. just looking at the prophets who are being bought by AstraZeneca or bought by a Democrat party or Republican party. We're looking at the prophetic people every day are seeing the gender of our kids being changed. And instead of using their Facebook page to actually share something relevant, they're talking about, you know, TikTok videos and, and makeup tutorials. And we're in an Esther 414 time. You can't be quiet at a time like this. You've got to use your voice. I'm, you know, I'm just blown away listening to you now because it's I'm, the pieces are coming together in my mind. And I've never heard that. Those of you watching, how many of you have learned something already? This Issacharian anointing and its connection with business, its connection with being liberated financially. I'm back in 2015, the Lord gave me a word concerning fish come first. And when Jesus told the disciples to follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, he had already asked them to follow him two previous times. And they would follow him for a weekend and then go back to their jobs. The miracle of the great catch of fish was a liberating miracle. It was the first miracle in the lives of the disciples to let them know that they didn't need their job for him to supply all their need according to his riches and glory. That's why Peter fell down and said, I, I, I'm undone. I'm, I'm not even worthy to be here because I've been following after business to pay my bills. Yeah. So many believers are bound by that. And it seems like the grip is getting tighter and tighter financially. That that's, that's the goal of the Antichrist spirit to control us fiscally as a church. Yes. And you're building something now with building Goshen and creating kind of a parallel economic system Talk to us a little bit about that and the importance of Christians learning to trust in the provision of God in the coming days. Well, two things I saw, Alan, I saw, first of all, the World Economic Forum and, the, and, and Davos and that agenda. And I heard the Lord say, what's your agenda? Hmm. What's, what's your economic forum? What's your gathering of, of economic leaders to discuss the new futures for the people of God? They're doing theirs. What have you got? And, you know, the church is praying for the destruction and demise of wicked agendas around the world. And God's not, God's not as interested in destroying chaff as he is in letting both chaff and wheat grow together. And whoever's one is the, the, the right one will stand strong at the end when the harvesters come and do their job. And so... When, you, when the Lord spoke to me about the Goshen message years ago, it was a word of the Lord that came to me in 2021. He said, tell them you have nine years left and nine years are going to feel like nine months and nine months are going to feel like nine days and nine days are going to feel like nine minutes. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're spearheading into 2030. I mean, we're, we're, it just feels like the, the years are getting shorter in between. Yes. And then what was really interesting was people started sending me after, I did that on Sid Roth as an interview. I think it had like 1 million views on that video. And then after that, people started sending me articles uh, from John Kerry and 
Joe Biden saying we have nine years left. And it just became a prophetic statement that word nine years. And now we have six years left. Mm-hmm. And it's not six years till Jesus comes back. That's not what we're saying. It's six years till the world as we know it changes forever. Forbes came out with a, uh, a, a news piece that said, by 2030, 300 million jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence. Yes. I worked in the marketplace as a, as a uh, I, you know, I studied law and somehow I found myself in digital marketing. I don't know how that happened, but I worked as a digital marketing consultant. And my job as head of marketing operations for Subaru Motors was replaced by AI and automation. Wow. And so I, I got to witness firsthand years ago when AI is still a baby, the world that is dramatically encroaching upon us. And, you know, we have these kind of people that work at the airports who are kind of angrily telling us, don't come to me, go use that machine over there. And I'm looking at them going, in a few years, (laughs) we're not going to be coming to you at all. You're going to be sitting at home wondering where your next job is going to come in and your job is going to be replaced by the person, the the machine you're telling me to go to, the self-service check-in. And then I was in a hotel and I watched a robot come and and do room service for people. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, we are, we are coming into that world. And of course, the, the big television screen made by Apple that people are now wearing on their faces in buses and public transport is just letting you know that um, we are heading into a new normal, a new, new normal. I mean, we've already been in a new normal for a while, but now we're heading into what the law calls a new, new normal. And... I believe prophetically it's time for the church to build Goshen. Mm. And what does that, what does that mean? What is Goshen? The first thing God delivered Israel from was an economic slavery. Yes. It was a slavery to their jobs. It was a slavery that hindered them from authentic worship because the tax system and the, and the, uh, the wage system were almost negative negatively and adversely affecting the progress of the children of Israel to be able to even worship God or to be able to even serve him. And so exodus and ecclesia are actually roots of the same word. Yes. Exodus means to come out of the way. That's what exodus means, to come out of the conventional way. Ecclesia means to come out of the world. And you realize the scripture says we're in this world, but not of this world. But actually, who is the we? It's the we that Jesus came to and said, leave your jobs, leave your that fishing net, exodus from it, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. And I love that fish first analogy you gave, because the one the Lord gave me was, if you learn to fish for men, just like Peter, there's money in the mouths of fish. There's, 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 there's the, everything you've been looking for is in the direction that I'm taking you into. And so if we become wage mentality people and not people mentality people, then we're going to be under that curse of laboring for work and the Adamic curse of sweat of our brow. But if we focus on what God tells us to focus on and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, there is great economic reward. When you look at Matthew 6, it was God's charter for economic success upon Mm. the mission. It was not God saying, be negligent about your life. In fact, it actually caveats Matthew 6 at the end by saying, your heavenly father knows you need these things. And so people say, you know, Christians shouldn't be materialistic. God knows you need materials. He actually said it. I know you need stuff. But look at the lilies. I clothe them. He didn't say I neglect them. He says, I I clothe them. Are you not more valuable? Won't I also clothe you? And then he says, oh, you have little faith. That means that we've had faith for healing. We've had faith for miracles, but we haven't had faith for clothes. We haven't had faith for food. And it's the same system. It's all faith that that Peter, you just recognized. He said, I'm unworthy. He said, where was your faith? In other words, I can give you faith for fish. I can give you faith for your business. But look what Peter did to the Lord. Peter said, Lord, this is fishing. Stick to your healings and miracles and your, and your shababava and laying hands yeah. on people. We'll this is do, business. 
we'll do the business stuff, you do the miracle stuff. Yeah. And actually, it's the same supernatural anointing. His divine power has given us everything we need for both life and godliness, not just godliness, void of life, and not just life void of godliness. You know, we have this common saying in the church that people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And I like to say, well, some people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. (laughs) There's actually a balance in the kingdom of heaven where God in his divine power, that same power for godliness is the same power for business. It's the same power for marketplace success. It's, it's the favor that we're going to need, actually. You read all these books called self, Self-Made Millionaire, and you realize there's no such thing. Hmm. Every one of us, um, I, 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 I could talk for days. I'm so sorry. I love I, I hope, it. No, I'm loving I this. I can, I can, you can just indulge me to just touch this one point. Please. The, the Bible says that he gave the sun and the moon, the sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the night. But in Genesis 1, he said, let there be light. And then in Genesis 1 verse 4, he said, let there be lights. And so you look and you go, how can God say, let there be lights and let there be light? And then if he said, let there be light, where did that first light come from? Because he made the sun on the third day. So that light can't be the same lights as in Genesis 1 verse 3. That light has to be the Isaiah 60 glory of God. Your light has come. The glory is risen upon you. That light that the Bible says never goes down by day or, or up by day or down by night because God will be an everlasting light. In other words, the power generator of city Zion is God's glory. Come on. And then he, then he says, I give the sun as light and the moon as a lesser light, but I've given them to rule the day and the night, not to rule the church. That's why if Joseph was to rule Goshen, the sun and the moon had to be under his feet. He had to rule over time. He had to have dominion over these cosmological, these cosmic powers that rule us. Because scripture, David was able enough to go, the sun won't strike you by day, the moon, nor the moon by night. In other words, these cosmic forces, witches and occultic powers actually use them as strike strike forces. That's why you look at Jericho, it's called the moon city. That's why most cities are moon cities or sun cities. And then you come to Solomon and Ecclesiastes, you begin to realize what was Ecclesiastes about? It was about a fallen man who lived life under the sun. The sun struck him and he's complaining about life under the sun. And he says, wow, life under the sun is hard. I remember when I was living life in the light of God's glory. Now I'm living life under the sun and I see under the sun, the race is into the swift, the battle is into the strong. Riches mm. don't belong to men of understanding. It's like under the sun, I, I'm more understanding than everybody, but under the sun, I don't seem to be succeeding. But time and chance happen to them all. And time is the symbol of the sun and the moon. That's what they govern. Chance is the realm of God. It's called favor. Hmm. In other words, when, you, when Solomon remembered his life in the glory realm, Doing business was not about time. Everybody got subject to, well, one day in the right time, I'll meet the right business person. They'll help me with my business. Solomon slipped seamlessly into favor and seamlessly into the right connection. Joseph had the same encounter. He was able to seamlessly come into prison situations and meet the very people that supernaturally would just by chance be the people that would promote him to the right person. And so you're going to need God's supernatural favor for business, just like you need it for ministry. I hope everybody is absorbing this. And if you have questions, write them in the comments, because I think we need to dig deeper into this on this channel. Fish, if I can just return to that analogy, represent commerce. It is the disciples' divine economy. It's how God supplies for his people. That's the reason why the first thing God blessed in creation is fish. The very first thing man was given dominion over, fish. The first miracle the disciples received that launched them into ministry, fish. Because if you don't get delivered from the wage mindset, and this is what I want to ask you about, how do we break free from a poverty mentality, from a secondhand mentality? How do we... How do we break through these rest- these constraints that so many watching this right now are bound by? Many of us, even though we believe in prosperity, have hit a, a hit our ceiling. It's almost we've reached our gag reflex, and we don't know how to break through. Yes, it's it's very difficult actually because 
if you look at the wage system, people are not motivated by money. Economists have studied this for years and they've actually discovered people aren't motivated by money. What motivates people is three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Hmm. Autonomy is the feeling like this is my job, you know? Even if it's a crummy job, I'm, I'm the king of McDonald's. I'm like, the, I'm like the king of the chip making or the French fry making department in McDonald's. It's autonomy. Mastery describes the desire to get better at something. So if there are paths to promotion, people tend to stay at a job longer, but there's no paths to promotion. It's like playing the piano. Nobody pays a kid to sit down behind a piano and learn it. They, they, they do it because they want to get better at it. So, yeah. so you discover these conditioning mechanisms and then purpose, a, a, a feeling of meaning behind companies. That's why most of the best companies have a spirit behind their organization, a, a message. And so companies have capitalized on this uh, to create a feeling of you're going to, if you keep running this rat race, you're going to get promoted one day. You're going to just keep running. You're going to get purpose. You're going to get mastery. You're going to do all of that there. And it takes us a long time to realize that just like uh, a dog can never have good character. It can only be trained and modify its behavior through conditioning. You know, you click a thing, the dog sits. You click a thing, the dog runs. You, you blow a whistle, the dog comes. You give him a treat, he's conditioned. The salary, uh, I love what my, my brother said one day in a business talk. He said, your salary is the bribe men pay you to forget about your destiny. <laughs> oh. oh, my goodness. Say, my that, say, say that again. Your salary is the bribe men pay you to forget about your destiny. Wow. And so you realize we're all being bribed out of what we're called to do. Thank God for the people who, what they're, called to do in their job are the same thing. But majority of us in the marketplace world, we're being bribed every day out of our purpose by the need to be conditioned into these treats. And these treats aren't big. It's like $1,500 average salary for come and work and you're working nine to five, nine to six, sometimes night shifts, but it's the conditioning of predictability, that at the mm -hmm. end of the month, I'm going to get a paycheck. It's, it's psychology that we've got to break people out of, the, the damaged psyche of the Egyptian uh, principality. I'm not talking about Egypt as a country, it's a wonderful country. I'm talking about the Egyptian principality. Egypt in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word Mitzrayim, which means to set a limit or a boundary or to confine. That's what it means. And so it's a principality we're speaking about that basically tells people, we're going to pay you at the end of every month, leeks and onions. What makes these slaves who have promised freedom, they leave with silver and gold, they bankrupt Egypt, take the whole GDP of Egypt in one day upon slave shoulders, and they're leaving with silver and gold and wealth. What makes them say, Long I missed those weeks and onions. Yes. Wow. Predictability. It's that conditioning. Yeah. It takes one day to deliver them from Egypt, but 40 years to deliver Egypt from them. It's mm -hmm. the conditioning of instant reward, instant gratification, the expectation of predictability. And so in order to break people free, you have to take them through a process called discipleship. It took Jesus three years to break these people. You saw them going back. And even when Jesus died, mm -hmm. by the way, Peter said his first statement was not, I'm really crying over Jesus. Like, guys, I'm going fishing. I don't know about any of you, but, <laughs> but I'm going back to fishing. And they all followed him back to fishing. That's why Jesus made those statements, lovest thou me more than this? Because it's like, how is it every time I leave you for a second, you're hopping back to that uh, one thing? And so psychology, that brings us back. And it takes about three years estimated to break people out of that psychology and repurpose them and retrain them to think about life beyond that, that psychology. I got to stop right here and interrupt. I had no idea that the conversation was going to go in this direction. And that it was going to be so amazing, the revelation about Goshen. The Goshen Marketplace Mentorship sounds like exactly what you need right now. So we're partnering with them to promote this. We want everyone to sign up and get mentored in this Goshen Marketplace Discipleship Program. It's unlike anything I've seen before. That's why we're standing behind it right now. Every single one of you needs to click this affiliate link in the description 
subscription and do it right now as you listen to the rest of this interview. You have nine years, but nine years will be as nine months. Nine months will be as nine minutes. The clock has now reversed. And before, where I put you in a counter, you are now in a countdown. John Kerry is sounding the alarm, pronouncing that the world has only nine years left to avert a climate catastrophe. Eight years left, the Lord says. Eight years for the new ecclesia. Eight years for a new world order. The Great Reset have a push for global government and why 2030 is such a pivotal year for this sinister agenda. I am raising your seven year Joseph plan. For 2030, only wealth will speak. The Great Reset is an idea to fundamentally restructure the global economy. 14 million jobs will disappear in the next five years as more companies adopt advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. Six years left. 2023 has ended and you now have six years left. Goshen was how they prepared for the famine on the horizon. They repositioned themselves in a place of financial favor, and that is the season we are now in today. It is time to deal Goshen. Yeah, so you, those of you watching, you have to commit yourself to this discipleship process and connect with this kind of teaching. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. By the way, uh, the first miracle Jesus did after his resurrection was a great catch of fish. And it wasn't to feed them. He already had fish on the shore. It was to fund Absolutely. their pursuit of him in the upper room. You can't have 120 people taking 10 days off unless there's provision there to care for them during That's those 10 right. days. So the great catch of fish helped prepare for Pentecost. So what are you doing now? You made this amazing statement. They have a World Economic Forum. Where is our economic forum? Where is... Where is our plan, our agenda? It seems like you're laying something out here. You're, you're putting a business plan together. What are you doing to provide a, a challenge to that Antichrist system? Well, we're taking a lot, of, a lot of risks this year to really build strategically with key marketplace leaders. And um, we're building, a, we've, well, we started building an organization this year that God just blessed supernaturally, financially, and and brought a lot of success with. And, and part of it is actually information sharing in five different sectors. We're, we're teaching people about land, farming, hmm. because I believe we have to go back to some kind of agrarian yes. cultures and train people in, in, in ground to mouth produce and actually supernatural farming, because I believe God's gonna bless the land that belongs to the body of Christ. I believe we have to go back to housing and assets. The Lord spoke to me clearly and he said, Toby, I don't want you to think about, I don't want you to think about being rich. I don't want you to think about being wealthy. I want you to go back to my original mandate. And I said, what is that? He said, dominion. Hmm. Rich people think about how much money do I have? Wealthy people think about how many assets do I have? Dominion people think about how much market share do I have? Wow. So who is the dominator in home delivery, Jeff Bezos, Amazon. So he is, he has dominion. And so when you think about dominion, you'll always be wealthy. When you think about riches and wealth, you always obsess about that. And so you think about all these organizations like World Economic Forum, Davos, all of them, they're not thinking about money. They're thinking about how can we trade our money for dominion? How can we mm. actually dominate countries, dominate nations, dominate spheres. And that word is a, is a scary word for many in the church today. They don't like the word dominion. There's actually a book about, oh gosh, it sounds like dominionism. Right. And anytime you put ism on the end of anything, people get cautious and scared. But look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, because they thought that the kingdom of God would immediately appear. Just like today, they had a kind of a Facebook eschatology mentality where I'm just going to post, I see a little flu called COVID. Oh my goodness, the end times are upon us. Jesus is coming back soon. And actually the Bible says, these are just the beginnings of sorrows. This, the end is not yet. We're in the beginnings of the end. This is not the end. This is the beginning of the end. And so he, 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 he shares this uh, with us because he's trying to get us to understand. 
is actually not coming back yet. When does he come back? Well, he says, this is the parable. And he says, he called men, he entrusted them with money, and he told them, occupy till I come. He didn't mm -hmm. say, be occupied till I come. He didn't say, be preoccupied about when I'm coming. He said, your assignment is military occupation till you see me come back. Don't sleep, don't rest, don't take a break. Stay at your station and occupy till I come back. Some translations actually say, do business till I come. The original Greek says, is pragmatiomai, where we get the word pragmatic from. Be pragmatic until I return. Be strategically pragmatic until you see me come back. Because the enemy guards his house. And the word house, people think the enemy guards human beings. He doesn't care about human beings. He guards his house. The word house is a really interesting word. It's oikonomos. It's where we get the word oikonomia or economy comes from. Hmm. So the devil is a guardian of economy. He wants money because the love of money is the root of all evil. He knows hmm. his end time mission cannot be achieved without wealth. We know that we want souls. Satan knows that he wants wealth. Why does Satan want wealth? Because wealth is the biggest soul winning strategy there is in the world today. Where your treasure is, your heart is. So he doesn't care if you go to church. He just needs you to make sure you're at work on Monday and that church is an option on Sunday because your boss needs you. And, and God knows you can't serve both God and mammon. So Satan uses the strategy of wealth to win souls. And we're still using the strategy of come to Christ, your life will be better. And actually, we actually need a wealth transfer to perpetrate a soul transfer. Because a wealth transfer will transfer hearts back to the church. That's why Isaiah 61 says, arise and shine. Isaiah, I, sorry, Isaiah 61 says, the Spirit of God is upon me because uh, the Lord has anointed me. The church for years has been used to the anointing, but we haven't been used to the glory. The anointing, if you, if you underline it, it brings victims. Everyone's a victim. The poor, the blind, the afflicted, the brokenhearted, the depressed, the heavy. Every one of them is a victim. Isaiah 60, every one of them is a victor. Kings are coming. Princes are coming. <laughs> Instead of their bronze, they're bringing silver. Instead of their silver, they're bringing gold to fill my house with glory. And then many will come from afar. Sons and daughters will come from afar. And they'll say, let us go to the house of the Lord. And your gates will never be shut. Why? Because a wealth transfer is actually a soul transfer. And we're going to see the biggest transfer of wealth back to the church before Jesus returns than we have ever seen in our life. And the religious spirit is going to be, oh, this is materialistic. This is terrible. This is horrible. It's nothing worse than crying for a billion soul harvest without a billion soul re uh, resource. Mm. There's nothing worse than asking God, send us a billion souls. And God's like, okay, you got all this vision Who's going to finance the billion soul harvest? We don't talk enough about the ministers who minister to Jesus with their resources. The woman who followed Jesus in ministry and the Bible says, and they ministered to him with their resources and provided for all his needs. Jesus had ministry needs and wealthy woman provided for his ministry. Apostle Paul had a female, a matron, called Phoebe, who was able to finance his ministry. In one offering in the book of Acts, when Simon the sorcerer got caught out, that church in one offering raised the equivalent of 19 million US dollars in a single offering. Wow. And so the church needs to not get sheepish about resources and finances that we know deep down inside we actually need for the harvest that's coming. I want you to pray for us. We're going to continue the conversation about 2024. I'm so glad this conversation took an unexpected turn in that direction because we, we need to build this parallel economy. We need to break people out of the Antichrist mentality. Cain was attacked his brother over finances, over an offering. Judas had that Antichrist spirit. 
was controlling the purse. We know the Antichrist controls the economy. We've got to break the spirit of mammon off of individuals. By the way, I don't know if you know this, we've started our own coffee company, speaking of parallel wow. economies. You like coffee? I you like love coffee, coffee, brother? I want to yes, send I, you this. My first company was a coffee company, so that's Well, this great. is the Wigglesworth blend. I don't know if you've had Wigglesworth coffee before. Oh, it, it'll God. awaken faith with the Wigglesworth blend, <laughs> and then we also have the Azusa Street Mornings for wow. a morning outpouring with William Seymour, so I'm going to send some of that to you. Those of you watching, if you'd Thanks. like some Encounter Coffee, go to EncounterCoffee.com. As we were talking about that, I, I'm trying to think of ways and, and get with ministers who are building a parallel economy, and it's been amazing what the Lord is doing throughout the world. Would you pray for us very quickly that, that yes. this poverty spirit would be broken and that we would receive a fresh glory for provision? Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, you know, the poverty spirit comes with the religious spirit. And so, Father, mm. we break every religious spirit. We break every assignment of the spirit of religion to hinder people from the very thing they need. You said in your word that they blocked people from entering and they themselves didn't enter. So, Father, I pray, break every spirit of poverty, every alignment with it. Lord, going back to the monastic era where we made vows to poverty. Father, we ask you right now, uproot those unrighteous foundations on the inside of us. But God, also yes. break the other extreme where we've become so lascivious and so needy that God, our income has been sp <laughs> spent on our own luxurious pursuits and not the advancement of your kingdom. Father, we know you delight in the prosperity of your people. And I hear somebody saying, oh, this sounds like a prosperity message. Well, it's certainly not a poverty message. Mm. So, Father, we break mm. that spirit of religion God, that is assigned to see prosperity as a wicked thing when it's the only thing that brings you great pleasure and delight. Father, you didn't put Adam and Eve in a famine land. You put them in a garden of delight. <coughs> Bring us to that delightful place, that pleasant places, those pleasant boundaries. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, y'all. If y'all receive that, write amen in the comments. What a, what a timely word that we need in the body of Christ. I want to keep this conversation going over at EncounterToday.com. Those of you who are watching, we're going to keep talking about 2024 and what's coming, but this free ebook that he's made available to you. The link is in the description. Seven prophetic things to prepare for in 2024. Take advantage of it. Click it. Read it right now. The link is in the description. We're going to keep talking about this. You've, you've had a lot to say, particularly about aliens in the book of Enoch, um, about what's coming in 2030. I'm releasing a book this month about aliens, AI, and the Antichrist. And so I want to pick your brain on this a little bit. So ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to join us over there, become a premium member at EncounterToday.com. The first month is only a dollar. We're just trying to get the riffraff out of the way so we can have uncensored conversations. Again, that's EncounterToday.com. Prophet Tommy, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. All right, we're heading over to EncounterToday.com. We'll see you there. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? He asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I said, well, sir, I think I know what it says. And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic. It turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed, and the U.S. government has the wreckage. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of uh, the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning a demon. 